the pitch offers guide to the galaxy, fundamentalist atoms. Yes. Oh, uh, interesting rhythmic 
devices too, which 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 seem to get, uh, counterpoint the, uh, the, the, the again. counterpoint the surrealism of the underlying metaphor of the um, uh, the humanity, the humanity, uh, the humanity, uh, sorry, of the uh, the poet's compassionate soul, uh, which could contrives through the medium of the verse structure to subliminate this, transcend that, and come to terms with the fundamental dichotomies of the other, and, and one is left with a profound and vivid insight, insight into. into into, into whatever the poem was about. <laughs> well done, Arthur. That was very good. So what you're saying is that I write poetry because beneath my mean, callous, heartless exterior, I really just want to be loved. Is that right? Uh, well, I, I mean, yes. Don't we all? Deep down, you know. No! <laughs> you're completely wrong. I only write poetry throw my mean, callous, heartless exterior into sharp relief. I'm going to throw you off the ship anyway. Go on! Take the prisoners to the number three airlock and throw them out. <laughs> uh, you, you can't do this. We're, we're trying to write a book. Resistance is useless. <laughs> but, but I don't want to die now. I've still got a headache. And I don't want to go to heaven with a headache. I'd be all cross and wouldn't enjoy it. You can't uh, do this. Why not, you puny creature? Why not? Why not? Does there have to be a reason for everything? Why don't you just let us go on a mad impulse? Go on, live a little. Surprise yourself. <laughs> Counterpoint the surrealism of the underlying metaphor. That's too good for them! Ow! Let go of me, you brute! Uh, don't you worry, I'll think of something. I, I woke up this morning and thought I'd have a nice, relaxed day. Do a bit of reading, cross the dog. It's now just four in the afternoon and I'm already being thrown out of an alien spaceship five years for the fucking remains of the earth. Uh, I just stop panicking. I'm so, I'm, who said anything about panicking? This is still just culture shock. You wait till I settle down and got my bearings a bit. Then I'll start panicking. Oh, you're getting hysterical. Shut up. Resistance is useless. You shut up as well. Resistance is useless. Give it a rest. You really enjoy this sort of thing. Resistance is... What do you mean? I mean, it <laughs> give you a full and satisfying life. Stepping around. Shouting. Pushing people off space chairs. Well, the hours are good. They have to be. <laughs> Now you come to mention it, I suppose most of the actual minutes are pretty lousy. Except some of the shouting I quite like. Resistance! Yeah, sure, you're good at that, I can tell. Uh, but if it's mostly lousy, then uh, why do you do it? What is it? The girls? The leather? The machismo? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I think I just sort of do it, really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You think you've got problems, Arthur? Yeah, this guy's still out throttling me. Yes, but try and understand his problem. Mm -hmm. Here he is for that. His entire life's work is stomping around and throwing people off of spaceships. I, I'm shouting. I'm shouting, sure. And he doesn't even know why he's doing it. Yes. <laughs> Sad. Well, now you put it like that, I suppose. Good lad. But, alright. So what's the alternative? Well... Stop doing it, of course. <laughs> mm, well, doesn't sound that great to me. Oh, now wait a minute, that's just a start. There's more to it than what you see. No, I think if it's all the same to you, I'd better just get you both shoved into this airlock and then go on and get on with some other bits of shouting I've got to do. Uh, but come on. Uh, now look! Ow! Stop that! Hang on, there's, there's music and art and things to tell you about stuff. Resistance is useless! You see, if I keep it up, I can eventually get promoted to senior shouting officer. And there aren't usually many vacancies for non-shouting and non-pushing people about officers. So I think I'd better stick to what I know. And thanks for taking an interest. Bye now! Uh, stop! Don't do it! I mean, wait, there's, there's a whole world that you don't know anything about! Here, listen. <clears throat> How about this? Dun 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 dun! Doesn't that stir anything in you? <laughs> Why, I'll mention what you said to my arm. Potentially, bright lad, I thought. We're trapped now, aren't we? Um, yes, yeah, we're trapped. Well, didn't you think of anything? Oh, yes, but unfortunately it rather involved being on the other side of the airtight hatchway they've just seen behind us. What happens next? Well, the hatchway in front of us will open automatically in a moment and we'll be shot out into deep space. 
So then says to Dixie Eight. In about 30 seconds. So, 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 so this is it? We're going to die? Yes. Except, no! Wait a minute! What's this switch? Uh, well, where? Where? Yeah. Yeah. That was only fooling. We are going to die after all. <laughs> you know, it's at times like this when I'm trapped in a Vogon airlock with a man from Beetlejuice and about to die of asphyxiation in deep space that I really wish I'd listened to what my mother told me when I was young. Why? What did she tell you? I don't know. I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a truly remarkable book. The introduction starts like this. Space, it says, is big. Really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the street to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. Listen. And so on. In the entry in which it talks about dying of asphyxiation, 30 seconds after being thrown out of a spaceship, it goes on to say that what with space being the size it is, the chances of being picked by, up by another craft within those seconds are 2 to the power of 267,709 to 1 against, which by a staggering coincidence was also the telephone number of an Islington flat where Arthur once went to a very good party and met a very nice girl, whom he entirely failed to give off with. Yeah. <laughs> Though the planet Earth, the Islington flat and the telephone have all now been demolished, it is comforting to reflect that they are in all some small way commemorated by the fact that 29 seconds later, Ford and Arthur were in fact rescued. Come on, the chances it gets to were astronomical. Don't knock it. It worked. Now, where are we? Uh, well, I, I, I hardly want to, to say this, but it looks like the seafront at South End. God, I, I'm relieved to hear you say that. But why? Because I thought I must be going mad. <laughs> well, well, perhaps we were rescued after all. Perhaps we died. What's that meant to mean? Well, when I was young, I used to have this nightmare about dying. I used to lie awake at night screaming. All my school friends went to heaven or hell, and I was sent to South End. <laughs> Perhaps we better ask somebody what's going on. Uh, how about that man over there? The, 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 I'm sorry, the, the, the one with the five heads crawling up the wall. Um, <laughs> yes? Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, excuse me? Uh, excuse me? <laughs> You mean the way the sea stays steady as a rock and the buildings keep washing up and down? Yes, I thought that was odd. <laughs> Two to the power of one hundred thousand to one against and falling. Hey, what was that? Sounds like a measurement of probability. It could mean... No. What? what? I, well, I'm not sure, but it means we are definitely on some kind of spaceship. Wait, so this is South End seems to be melting away. My legs are drifting off into the sunset. Hell, my left arm's gone off. How am I going to operate my digital watch now? Uh, Ford, you're turning into a penguin. Stop it. Two to the power of 75,000 to one against and fallen. Hey, who are you? Uh, where are you? And what's going on? Is there any way of stopping it? Please relax. You're perfectly safe. That's not the point! The point is that I am now a perfectly safe penguin! Uh, and my colleague here is rapidly running out of limbs! Yeah, it, it, it's alright, I've got them back now. Two to the power of 50,000 to one against and fallen. Admittedly, they're longer than I usually like them, but... Uh, uh, look, isn't there any... <clears throat> now, isn't there anything you ought to be telling us? Welcome to the Starship Heart of Gold. Please do not be alarmed by anything you see or hear around you. You are bound to feel some initial ill effects as you have been rescued from certain death at an improbability level of 2 to the power of 267,709 to 1 against, possibly much higher. 
We are now cruising at a level of 2 to the power of 25,000 to 1 against and falling. Oh, and we will be restoring normality as soon as we are sure what is normal anyway. Thank you. 2 to the power of 20,000 to 1 against and falling. Ah, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, we've been picked up by a ship with an infinite improbability drive. This is really incredible, Arthur. Arthur, what, what's happening? Uh, uh, Four. Uh, there's an infinite number of monkeys outside. You want to talk to us about the screw for how they go out. The infinite improbability drive is a wonderful new method of crossing interstellar distances in a few seconds without all that tedious fucking about from hyperspace. Five to one against and falling. Four to one against and falling. Three to one. Two. One. Probability factor of one to one. We have normality. I repeat, we have normality. Anything you still can't cope with is therefore your own problem. Please relax. You will be sent for soon. Uh, who are they, Trillian? Just a couple of guys, I expect, that we picked up in open space. Sector ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Yeah, well, that's a very sweet thought, Trillian, but do you really think it's wise under the circumstances? I mean, here we are on the run and everything, we got the police of half the galaxy after us, and we stopped to pick up hitchhikers. Okay, so ten out of ten for style, but minus several million for good thinking, eh? Say, far, they were floating unprotected in open space. You didn't want them to die, did you? Well, uh, not as such, no. Um, uh... Anyway, I didn't pick them up. The ship did it all by itself. What? Whilst we were in improbability drive. That's incredible! Uh, no, just very, very improbable. <laughs> Look, don't worry about the aliens. They're just a couple of guys, I expect. I'll send the robot down to check them out. Hey, Marvin! I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Oh, God! Well, here's something to occupy you and keep your mind off things. It won't work. Marvin? I have an exceptionally large mind. All Go. right, what do you want me to do? Go down to number two entry bay and bring the two aliens up here under surveillance. Just that. <laughs> yes. I won't enjoy it. She's not asking you to enjoy it. Just do it, will you? All right. Good. I'll do it. Great. Thank you. I'm not getting you down at all, am I? No, oh, no, Marvin. That's just fine, really. I wouldn't like to think I was getting you down. No. Don't worry about that. You just act as comes naturally and everything will be fine. You're sure you don't mind? No! No! It's just all part of life! Don't talk to me about life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think I can stand that robot much longer, Zephon. The Encyclopedia Galactica defines a robot as a mechanical apparatus designed to do the work of a man. The marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation defines the robot as Your Elastic Pound! Who's fun to be with? I think this shit is brand new, Arthur. How can you tell? Have you got some exotic devices for measuring the age of men? No, I just found the sales brochure lying on the floor. Uh, uh, the universe can be yours. Ah, and look, I was right. Uh, sensational new breakthrough in improbability of physics. Uh, as the ship's drive reaches infinite improbability, it passes through every conceivable point in every conceivable universe almost simultaneously. Uh, you select your own re-entry point, be the envy of other major governments. This is big league stuff. Well, it does hell, look a hell of a lot better than that dingy Bogon ship. This is my idea of a spaceship, all gleaming white, flashing lights, everything. What happens if I press this button? I wouldn't. <laughs> oh. Uh, what happened? Uh, the sign lit up saying, please do not press this button again. <laughs> <laughs> I make a big thing with the ship's cybernetics. Uh, a new generation of serious cybernetics corporation robots and computers with a new GPP feature. GPP? What's that? Uh, it says, uh, Genuine People Personalities. Sounds costly. Yeah. It is. What? Ghastly. It all is. Absolutely ghastly. Just don't even talk about it. Look at this door. 
All the doors in this spaceship have a cheerful and sunny disposition. <laughs> it is their pleasure to open for you and their satisfaction to close again with the knowledge of a job well done. Yeah. <laughs> Hateful, isn't it? Come on. I've been ordered to take you up to the bridge. Here I am, brain the size of a planet, and they tell me to take you up to the bridge. Call that job satisfaction, because I don't. Excuse me, um, which government owns this ship? You watch this door. It's about to open again. I can tell by the intolerable air of smugness it suddenly generates. Come on. Glad for your service. Thank you, the marketing division of the Serious Cybernetics Corporation. You're welcome. Um, which government owns this ship? Let's build robots with genuine people personalities, they said. So they tried it out with me. I'm a personality prototype. You can tell, can't you? Um, well, I, I hate that door. I'm not getting you down, am I? Which government owns this ship? No government owns it. It's been stolen. Stolen? Stolen? Why? <laughs> Zephod Beeblebrox. Zephod Beeblebrox? Sorry, did I say something wrong? Pardon me for breathing, which I never do anyway, so I don't know why I bothered to say it. Oh God, I'm so depressed. Here's another one of those self-satisfied doors. Life. Don't talk to me about life. No, no one even mentioned it. Really? Zephod Beeblebrox? <laughs> And news reports brought to you here on the Sunny the Wave Band, broadcasting around the galaxy and around the clock. And we'll be saying a big hello to all intelligent life forms out there to everyone else. The secret is to bang the rocks together, guys. And the big news tonight is the sensational theft of the new improbability drive prototype ship by none other than Safod Beeble Brocks. And the question everyone's asking is, has the big Z finally flipped? Beeblebrox, the man who invented the pan-galactic garble blaster, ex-confidence, trickster part-time galactic president, once described by eccentric elements as the best bang since the big one, and recently voted the worst dressed sentient being in the universe for the seventh time running, has he got an answer for us this time? We asked his private brain care specialist, Guy Calfront. Well, Zayton is just this guy, you know? Ah, what'd you turn it off for, Trillian? Zayton, I've just thought of something. Yeah? We picked those couple of guys up in sector... Oh, Zephod. Uh, please take your hand off me. And the other one? Oh, thank you, and the other one. Uh, thank you. You know, I grew that one especially for you, Trillian. You know what? It took me six months, but it was worth every minute. We picked them up in sector Z, Z9, plus Z Alpha. Does that mean anything to you? On the whole? No. It's where you originally picked me up. Let me show it to you on the screen. Right there. Oh, hey, right! I don't believe it! How the hell did we come to be there? In probability drive. We passed through every point in the universe, you know that. Yeah, so picking them up there is just too strange a coincidence. I want to work this out. Computer! Oh, hi there! <laughs> oh, God. I want you to know that whatever your problem, I am here to help you solve it. Uh, look, I think I'll just use a piece of paper. Sure thing, I understand, but if you ever need... Shut up! Okay, okay. Trillian, listen, now the ship picked them up all by itself, right? Right. So that already gives us a high improbability factor. Now it picked them up in that particular space sector, which gives us another high improbability factor. Plus, they were not wearing space suits, so we picked them up during a crucial 30-second period. I've got a note of that factor right here. Well, you put it all together, we have a total improbability of, um, well... It's pretty vast, but it's not infinite. Now, at what point did we actually pick them up? At infinite um, improbability level. Which leaves us a very large improbability gap still to be filled. Now look, they're on their way up here right now, aren't they, with that uh, bloody robot? Can we uh, pick them up on any monitor cameras? I should think so. <laughs> And then, of course, I've got this terrible pain in all the diodes down my left side. Is that so? Oh, yes. I mean, I've asked for them to be replaced, but no one ever listens. I can imagine. Oh, God, I don't believe it. Well, well, well. 
Save for people, Brooks. Oh, I don't believe it! This is just too amazing! Look, Chili, I'll just handle this. Um, is it okay? I think I'll just wait in the cabin. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, this is gonna be great! I'm gonna be so unbelievably cool about it, it would flummox a vegan snow lizard. This is terrific! What real cool several million points out of ten for stuff. Well, you just enjoy yourself, Zavar. I don't see what's so great about it myself. I'll go listen to the police on the sub the wake band. Right! All right. Now, which is the most nonchalant chair to be discovered working at? Okay. That's me a servant. I suppose you'll want to see the aliens now. Do you want me to sit in the corner and rust or just fall apart where I'm standing? Show them in, please, Marvin. Ford. Hi. How are you? Glad you could drop in. Zaybard, uh, great to see you. You're looking well. Extra arm suits you. Uh, nice ship you stole. Uh, do you mean you know this guy? I know him. This is, oh, Zaybard, uh, this is a friend of mine, Arthur Dent. I saved him when his planet blew up. Oh, sure. Hi, Arthur. Glad you could make it. And Arthur, this is my son. Oh, we've met. What? Uh, have we? But hey! What do you mean you've met? Uh, this is Zaybar Beeblebrox from Beeple Juice 5, you know. The bloody Martin Smith from Croydon. I don't care. We've met. Haven't we, Zayford? Or should I say, Phil? What? Oh, you'll have to remind me. I have a terrible memory for a species. Uh, hey, Ford. I was at a party. I rather doubt it. Yeah, cool it, will you, Arthur? A party six months ago. On Earth. Uh, England. London. Uh, uh, Islington. Oh, uh, that party. Say, Fard, you don't mean to say that you've been on that miserable little planet as well, do you? Uh, no, no, of course not. Well, um, I may have dropped in just briefly, on my way somewhere. What is all this, Arthur? Well, at this party there was a girl. I'd had my eye on her for weeks. Beautiful, charming, devastatingly intelligent, everything I've been saving myself up for. And just when I'd finally managed to get her to myself for a few tender moments, this friend of yours barges up and says, Hey doll, is this guy boring you? Come and talk to me. I'm from a different planet. I never saw her again. Zavon. Uh, yes, you, you know, the, 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 the two arms and the one head, but, and he called himself Phil, but it was... He did actually turn out to be from a different planet, Arthur. Good God, it's her, Trisha McMillan. What are you doing here? Same as you, Arthur. I hitched a ride. After all, with a degree in maths and another in astrophysics, it was either that or back to the old dole queue on Monday. <laughs> Sorry I missed that Wednesday lunch date, but I was in a black hole all morning. Oh my God, Ford, this is Trillian. Hi. Trillian, this is my semi-cousin Ford, who shares three of the same mothers as me. Hi. Trillian, is this kind of thing going to happen every time we use the infinite probability drive? Very probably, I'm afraid. Zaphod Beeblebrox, this is a very large drink. Hi. Will our heroes be able to enjoy a nice, relaxed evening at last? How will they cope with their new social rules? Find out in the next exciting installment of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And that program will be broadcast through a time warp on the BBC Home Service in 1951. Hi there, this is Eddie, your shipboard computer, and I just want to mention here that we are now moving into orbit around the legendary planet of Magrathea. Sorry to interrupt your social evening and have a good time. Arthur Dent, a perfectly ordinary Earthman, was rather surprised when his friend Ford Pigbeck suddenly revealed himself to be from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Beetlejuice, and not from Guildford after all. He was even more surprised when a few minutes later, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass, but this was as nothing to their joint surprise when they are rescued from certain death by a stolen spaceship manned by Ford, semi cousin the infamous state Bob Beeblebrox, and Trillian, a rather nice astrophysicist Arthur, once met at a party in Islington. However, all four of them are soon totally overwhelmed with surprise when they discover that the ancient world of Magrathea, a planet famed in legend for its surprising trade in manufacturing other planets, is not as dead as it was supposed to be. For Zephyr, Ford, and Trillian, 
Surprise is pushed to its very limits when this happens. Ah! And <laughs> Arthur Dent encountered Sparky Barnfast, the Magrathian coastline designer who won an award for his work on Norway, and learns that the whole history of mankind was run for the benefit of a few white mice anyway. Surprise is no longer adequate, and he is forced to resort to astonishment. Mice? Oh, what do you mean, mice? I think we must be talking at cross purposes. Mice to me mean little white furry things with a cheese fixation, and women standing screaming on tables in early 60s sitcoms. Earthman, it is sometimes hard to follow your mode of speech. Remember that I have been asleep inside this planet of Magrathia for five million years. I know little of these early 60s sitcoms of which you speak. These creatures you call mice, you see, are not real as they appear. They are merely the protrusion into our dimension of vast, hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings. Uh, the, whole, the whole business with the squeaking and the cheese is, uh, is just a front. A front? Oh, uh, yes, you see. Uh, the mice said that the whole Earth business is an epic experiment in behavioral psychology. A uh, ten million year no, 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 program... No, 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 look, 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 you've got it the wrong way around. It was us. We used to do the experiments on them. A ten million year program in which your planet Earth and its people formed the matrix of an organic computer. I gather that the mice did arrange for you humans to do some primitively space experiments on them, just to check how much you really learned, you know, give the old prod in the right direction, you know, the sort of thing, uh, sort of suddenly running down the ways the wrong way, like eating the wrong bit of cheese, or suddenly dropping dead of a mix of toasts. Attention, please. Slotty Botfast would Slotty Botfast and the visiting Earth creature please report immediately to the works reception area. Thank you. However, in the field of management relations, they're absolutely shocking. Really? Yes, well, you see, every time they give me an order, I just want to stand on a table and scream. Oh, you can see there'll be a problem. There are, of course, many problems connected with life, of which some of the most popular are why are people born? Why do they die? And why do they spend so much of the intervening time wearing digital watches? Many millions of years ago, a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings got so fed up with all the constant bickering about the meaning of life which used to interrupt their favorite pastime of Rocky and Ultra Cricket, a curious game which involved suddenly hitting people for no readily apparent reason and running away. But they decided to sit down and solve the problem once and for all. And to this end, they built themselves a stupendous supercomputer, which was so amazingly intelligent that even before its data banks had been connected up, it had started with first principles with I think, therefore I am, that it got as far as deducing the existence of rice pudding and income tax before anyone managed to turn it off. Could a mere computer solve the problem of life, the universe, and everything? Fortunately for posterity, there exists a tape recording of what transpired when the computer was given this particularly monumental task. Arthur Dent stops off in Slotty Montclass study to hear it. What is this great task for which I, Deep Thought, the second greatest computer in the universe of time and space, have been called into existence? Your task. Oh, computer! Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute, this isn't right. Uh, deep Thought? Speak and I will hear. Uh, are you not as we designed you to be, the, the greatest, most powerful computer in all of creation? I describe myself as the second greatest, and such I am. Oh, but this is preposterous. Are you not a greater computer than a milliard gargantua brain at maximum megalon, which can count all the atoms in a star in a millisecond? The milliard gargantua brain, a mere abacus. Mention it not. And are you not a greater analyst than the Googleplex star thinker in the seventh galaxy of light and ingenuity that can calculate the trajectory of every single dust particle for a five week out of air and sand lizard? A five week sand lizard? You ask this of me who has contemplated the very vectors of the atoms in the Big Bang itself? Molest me not with this pocket calculator stuff. And are you not? A more fiendish disputant 
than the great hyperlobic omnicognate neutron wrangler that can The argue. great hyperlobic omnicognate neutron wrangler can talk four legs off an octuran mega donkey, but only I can persuade it to go for a walk afterwards. If it then what's the problem? I speak of none but the computer that is to come after me. Oh, come on, I think this is getting needlessly messianic. You know nothing of future time, and yet, in my teeming circuitry, I can navigate the infinite delta streams of future probability and see that there must one day come a computer whose merest operational parameters I am not worthy to calculate, but which it will be my destiny eventually to design. Can we get on and ask the question? Speak. Oh, deep thought computer. The task we have designed you to perform is this. We want you to tell us the answer. The answer? The answer to what? Life. The universe. Everything. Tricky. But can you do it? Yes, I can do it. There is an answer. A simple answer. Yes. Life, the universe, and everything, there is an answer. But I'll have to think about it. What's happening? We demand admission! Come on, you can't keep us out. We demand that you come keep us out! Well, who are you? What do you want? We're busy. I am magic thighs. And I demand that I am room on you. It's alright, you don't need to demand that. Alright, I am room on you, and that is not a demand. That is a sole in fact. What we demand is sole in facts. No, we don't. That is precisely what we don't demand. Uh, we don't demand sole in facts. Uh, what we demand is a total absence of sole in facts. I demand that I may or may not be room bundle. Uh, who are you anyway? We are philosophers. That we may not be. Yes, we are. Oh, sorry, we are definitely here as representatives of the amalgamated union of philosophers, sages, luminaries, and other professional thinking persons. And we want this machine off, and we want it off now! And what is all this? We demand that you get rid of it. Well, what's the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is, mate. Demarcation. That's the problem. We demand that demarcation may or may not be the problem. You just let the machines get on with the adding up, and we'll take care of the eternal verities. Thank you very much. By law, the quest for ultimate truth is quite clearly the inalienable prerogative of your working talents. Any bloody machine goes and actually finds it, we're straight out of a job, aren't we? I mean, what's the use of our sitting up all night saying there may, or may not be, or may not be a god if this machine comes along the next morning and gives you his bleeding telephone number? Uh, we demand guaranteed, rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. Might I make an observation at this point? You keep out of this, middle nose. We demand that that machine not be allowed to think about this problem. If I might make an observation. But we'll go on strike. That's right. You'll have a national philosopher's strike on your hands. <laughs> who will that inconvenience? What? <laughs> Never mind who will inconvenience you, box of black-legging binary bits. It'll hurt, Buster. It'll hurt. If I might make an observation, all I wanted to say is that my circuits are now irrevocably committed to computing the answer to life, the universe, and everything. But the program will take me seven and a half million years to run. Seven and a half million years? Yes, I said I'd have to think about it, didn't I? And it occurs to me that running a program like this is bound to cause sensational public interest, and so any philosophers who are quick off the mark are going to clean up in the prediction business. Prediction business? Obviously. You just get on the pundit circuit. You all go on the chat shows and the color supplements and violently disagree with each other about what answer I'm eventually going to produce. And if you get yourselves clever agents, you'll be on the gravy train for life. Bloody hell. <laughs> now that is what I call thinking. Here, Goofondle, why do we never think of things like that? I don't know. I think our minds must be too highly trained, Magic Thighs. 
but, but I don't understand. What, what all this has got to do with the earth and mice and things? All will become clear to you, Earthmen. Are you not anxious to hear what the computer had to say seven and a half million years later? Oh, well, yes, uh, of course, quite. Here are the recording of the events of that fateful day. Deep thought designed it, we built it, and you lived on it. 
And the Vogons came and destroyed it five minutes before the program is completed. Yes, ten million years of planning and work gone just like that. Well, that's bureaucracy for you. <laughs> you know, it, all this explains a lot of things. All through my life I've had this strange, unaccountable feeling that something was going on in the world. Uh, something big, even sinister. And no one would tell me what it was. No, that's just perfectly normal paranoia. Everyone in the universe has that. Uh, well, well, perhaps that means somewhere outside the universe. Oh, God. Maybe, who cares? Uh, perhaps I'm old and tired, but I always think that the chances of finding out what really is going on are so absurdly remote. The only thing one can do is say, hang the sense of it and keep yourself occupied. Look at me. I design coastlines. I got an award for Norway. Where's the sense in that? None that I can see. I've been doing fuels all my life. And for a fleeting moment, they become fashionable, and I get a major reward. In the replacement earth we're, we're building, they've given me Africa to do, and of course I'm doing it with all fjords again, because I happen to like them, and I'm old-fashioned enough to think they give a lovely Baroque feel to a continent. And they tell me it's not equatorial enough. What does it matter? Science has achieved some wonderful things, of course, but I'd far rather be happy than right any day. And are you? No. <laughs> That's what all falls down, of course. Oh, pity. It, it sounded like quite a good lifestyle, otherwise. Attention, please. Slarty Bart Fest. Would Slarty Bart Fest and the visiting Earth creature please report immediately, repeat immediately to the works reception area. The mice aren't wanting to hang about in this dimension all day. Come on. I suppose we better go see what they want. You know, I, I seem to be having this tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle. As soon as I reach some kind of definite policy about what is my kind of music and my kind of restaurant and my kind of overdraft, people start blowing up my kind of planet and throwing me out of their kind of spaceships. It's so hard to build up anything coherent. I'm sorry, all this, all this must sound like a fascist to you. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> oh, just forget I said it. Arthur, you're safe! Oh, uh, am I? Good. Hi, Arthur, come and join us. Oh, oh, Ford, a trillion, say Ford. Uh, what, what happened to you? Well, our host here attacked us with a fantastic dismodulating anti-face stun ray, and then invited us to this amazingly keen meal by way of making it up to us. Uh, host? Uh, what host? I don't see any hosts. Welcome to lunch, Earth creature. Uh, uh, what? Uh, who, who said that? Oh, there's a mouse on the table. Oh, uh, haven't you found out yet, Arthur? Uh, what? Uh, oh, 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 I, 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 I see. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I just wasn't quite prepared for the full reality of it. Arthur, let me introduce you. This is Benji Mouse. Hi. And this is Frankie Mouse. Nice to meet you. It seems they have uh, quite control of a large sector of the universe in our dimension. Oh, but, but aren't they the... Yes, they are the mice I took with me from the Earth. It seems our whole journey was stage managed from the beginning. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Thank you, Sparty Bartfast. You may go. What? Oh. Very well, uh, thank you, sir. I'll just uh, go and get on with some of my floors then. Uh, in fact, that won't be necessary. We won't be requiring the new earth after all. We've had this rather interesting proposition put to us. What? Uh, you can't mean that. I've got a thousand glaciers poised and ready to roll over Africa. Well, perhaps you can take a quick skiing holiday before you dismantle it. Skiing holiday? Uh, those glaciers are works of art. Elegantly sculpted contours, soaring pinnacles of ice, deep majestic ravines. Why, it would be sacrilege to go skiing on high art. Thank you, Slarty Bart Fast. That will be all. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Well, uh, goodbye, old man. I hope the lifestyle comes together. <laughs> oh, no, uh, goodbye then. Sorry about the fjords. Now, to business! To business! I beg your pardon. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were proposing a toast. Uh, now, Earth Creature, we have, as you know, been more or less running your planet for the last ten billion years in order to find this wretched thing called the ultimate question. Uh, why? No, we already thought of that one. It doesn't fit the answer. Uh, why, 42s? It doesn't work. Uh, no, no, I mean, why have you been doing it? Well, eventually, just habit, I think, to be brutally honest, and this is one less point. We're sick to the teeth of the whole thing.
thing, and the prospect of doing it all over again on one of those wooden written vulgons, quite frankly, gives me the screaming heebie-jeebies, you know what I mean. We've been offered a quite enormously fat contract to do the 5D TV chat show and lecture circuit, and I'm very much inclined to take it. Oh, I would, wouldn't you, Ford? Oh, yes, jump at it like a shot. I mean, yes, idealism, yes, the dignity of pure research, and yes, pursuit of truth in all its forms. But it comes a point, I'm afraid, you begin to suspect that if there's any real truth, it's that the entire multi-dimensional infinity of the universe is almost certainly being run by a bunch of maniacs. And if it comes to a choice between spending another ten million years running that out, and on the other hand, just taking your money and running, exactly the attitude those philosophers took. Does no one in this galaxy do anything other than appear on chat shows? The point is this. We are in a position to give you a very important commission. We still want to find the ultimate question because it gives us a lot of bargaining muscle on the 5D TV companies. So it's worth a lot of money. Mentioning we happen to know the answer to, and then eventually have to admit that it's 42, then I think the show's probably quite short. Uh, yes, but doesn't that mean you've got to go through your whole 10 million year program again? We think there might be a shortcut. Your agent. Uh, that's me. Is it? Your agent has suggested that both you and the Ed Girl, as generational products of the computer matrix, are probably in an ideal position to find the question for us and find it quickly. Go ahead and find it for us, and we'll make you a reasonably rich man. Oh, uh, we're holding out for extremely rich. <laughs> All right. Extremely rich. You drive a hard bargain, people, Brooks. Emergency, emergency. A uh, hostile ship has landed on planet. Tr intruders in the works reception area. Defense stations, defense stations. Hells, bells, what is it now? Zayford, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Police! Hell and bats, dudes, we've got to get out! Police? Yeah, it's this wretched spacecraft we sell them. Yeah, I left them a note explaining how they could make a profit on the insurance claim, but it doesn't seem to have worked. Well, come on, then, let's move. Open find us the question! Assuming our heroes survive this latest reversal of their fortunes, will they find somewhere reasonably interesting to go now? Will Arthur Dent or Trillian manage to find the question to the ultimate answer? Find out if you can. The meaning of life! has been brought to you by kind permission of the Amalgamated Union of Philosophers, Sages, Luminaries, and other professional thinking persons.